Um, so can you please tell us um, a little bit about your family's history during the genocide and, and what towns they lived in before the genocide? Well, when I was born, I was born in 1923, uh, October 28, which uh, is next month. I will be 97 years old. Amazing. Now I'm 96, yeah. <laughs> wow. And I wasn't actually in the genocide, but my parents were running an orphanage. So I was with the orphans. First, they ran an orphanage for boys, and then it was changed to the girls. There were a lot of older girls like me now, <laughs> or they were young girls, middle-aged girls, young girls. There were about close to 100 of them. And, but we lived a separate section of the orphanage, my family. And I was with them. We used to play games with the young ones. And my parents were sending them, the young ones to school to learn Armenian. And some of them were sent to trade schools like they wanted them to become dressmakers or nursing schools so they could turn to become nurses. Or some were going to learn jewelry work. And, and then the, each, they were divided into different groups, the older ones who took care of the cooking they would learn how to cook, set the table, wash the dishes, put them away. This was their job of, of each group when their turns came. Say every six weeks they had a turn to do this kind of work in the orphanage. And they would do it willingly. And the older ones, as they were growing up, they were trying to get some Armenian families to come and get introduced if they have young men to get married and start Armenian families to fill the vacancy that was left by the genocide. A lot of families were wiped out. So, they would come, they would, they would give them chairs to sit <laughs> at the, uh, say, the entrance of the dining room. So they could see as the girls came by, if they picked some, one or two, whichever it was, they would tell my father about it, and then they would go in my father's office and they would call the girls to come to the office and get introduced. If they cared enough, they would ask permission if they could take them out, you know, and spend a little time with them, introduce them to their homes. So this way, a lot of them got married to Armenian men too which was very happy. We were very, you know, my parents were very happy that here was an Armenian couple uh, to replace the dead ones. And, uh, mm -hmm, let me see what else was. Well, gradually, they came down the numbers, you know. Uh, the this older girls got married, and they left, and the young ones replaced them in their jobs and everything. Uh, they were very, very thankful to my father, especially, for organizing the orphanage, and 
this orphanage was formed in uh, one second. Can I go and get the paper? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. In international Cup in Armenia. What's, what's the name of it? That's the AMAA magazine. Um, in medical? Uh, no, no, this is in Armenia. Armenian Missionary Association of America. Uh, okay. And her father is mentioned in one of the articles. Oh, wow. Talk here, the rescue of Armenians in the Middle East, 1915 to 1923. This is when he had, they had the orphanage. And this is supposed to be quite a big conference. They're going to go from every part of the world. Uh, when is it going to be? Well, it was supposed to be this year, but with this coronavirus, <laughs> I think they postponed it. There was never. Have you heard about this um, Montayan? He's a professor. Montayan? I don't uh, think so. Well, he had, and this lady here, Noreen Margarian. These are quite uh, educated people who had found out. We were surprised about my father and the orphanage. And starting, oh, see, this is studies program in modern and classical languages and literature at the University of California. Northbridge, Dr. Vahram Shamasya. Wow. I think I might have heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, they're quite yeah. Uh, high yeah. people, you know. Yeah. And Maharaj Shahmansia and Norbish and, uh, and here it says pro Armenians activities of Reverend Aharon Shiraja. My father was a pastor. So is that your father's the, name? The whole thing, uh, is that your father's name? Aharon. Okay. A H A R O N. Aharon Shiraja. And uh, so th these people, I mean, they were really uh, planning on having something big. And all the story of the genocide was going to be in there in the orphanage probably they would have had some pictures too. Because in Armenia, there is a museum, the Armenian Museum, and I think they have some pictures there of the, uh, you know, genocide and the orphanage too. That's what we heard. I, I, I went to Armenia, but sorry that <laughs> the day I went to see it, the museum was closed. Uh, but now they're really working on it to have it open because too many Armenians are traveling and going now to Armenia and they want to go and see everything. Do you know which museum it is? Beg your pardon? Oh, do you know which museum it is? Uh, that, I don't know. It was downtown somewhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's the genocide uh, museum. How many museums do they have? This is a, a really a national museum. Uh, uh, I have a question. The question was, uh, what museum you said? I really the don't know the National museum or the how genocide museum? How many museums are there? They have a lot of museums. Is it the national museum or the genocide museum? Well, this is really, it was supposed to be a town museum. So national museum, whatever it is. Was it was it the museum? It's not the small museum. The one in Harapara? I don't I don't know the real name to say that oh it's in this museum. That's okay. <laughs> that I don't know. Um, and as I went, but I don't remember so many years ago. No, no, and uh, see, all these people have well, come from right, all over the city, city. Right. to Armenia, and they were playing in a very big reunion. But as I said, this coronavirus spoiled everything for everybody.
So probably they will be doing it next year. And okay. if things, you know, get improved with the virus, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's not waste much time. It's it's at mid midnight. Okay. And it's not very easy let's to go. I'm are they okay? To oh. her friend. Yeah, but, hey, uh, yeah. can you yeah. tell us um where your family came from before they were in Syria? Yeah, when after my father passed away. My mother's sides were all here, her sisters were here, and they got after us saying, you shouldn't stay in Syria. You know, it's not safe for the future to be in an Arab country. You should come to the States. So we applied. We didn't have a, a ambassador uh, or what do you call it, uh, the office uh, where you go to have your things done, your papers. Consulate. Mm -hmm. Just then, the, the Americans opened the, an office. So we went right away and we said that we like to come to the States. Uh, and they said, why do you want to come? Because we said we think that my uh, mother's sides the her sisters are all in america and it's a safer country and uh, we would like to go to america if it's possible so right away uh, they said well get all your papers ready first you know you had to apply fill up papers and they would check it over to see if everything is right and then they called us and they said okay you come and take your uh, visas to go to the states so 1947 we got our visas and we were able to get there were not too many uh, you couldn't travel by plane then the planes that were used for the war. So we had to um, apply for, to look for ships that were coming. And there was one Russian ship that was going from Israel to America. So we applied and we got seats on there. So we took that ship uh, oh, we went to, from Aleppo, by train we went to Beirut, Lebanon. From Lebanon we went to Haifa, that's Israel. From there we got on the ship and we came to, it took us 17 days, that I remember, to travel. <laughs> by plane you make it in a day, by ship it took us 1947, it took us 17 days to travel all the Mediterranean, then you go to the Atlantic, and finally we arrived to New York, where my sister and my brother-in-law, they were waiting for us at the airport. But uh, so then it was Sunday, you can't, they don't let you out on Sunday. So we had to stay another day on the ship until the next day. And they called my sister to come on the ship. And they said, are you taking responsibility for these people? She said, yes, I am taking responsibility. So she signed the papers and they let us out. So that's how we came. We went from there to Connecticut. We stayed with my sister for a year and a half. Then my mother's sister came, David, to welcome us to America. And they said, this is not the state you should be living. You should come to Rhode Island because there, there are churches. There is Armenian community. 
here you have your loss among Americans. <laughs> okay, we said, so after a year and a half, we decided to move to Rhode Island and we settled in Rhode Island. And we have been in Rhode Island <laughs> ever since. We went to different places, but we always came back to Rhode Island. So, and here we belong to a church, which was, well, we had um, two church, three churches, actually. The Armenians had two churches. The Tashnak Tsagans had their own church. And the other group had their own church. They were like Democrats and Republicans, the Armenians. And we are the Protestants. <laughs> and we had our own church. So we joined it. We were very active in the church until I got old. <laughs> and now I don't, I can't go anymore. Otherwise I was a member of the choir. We used to sing in the choir or give in the ladies guild. We were very active, but I'm not active anymore now. <laughs> so I I have a question for you. Um, I want to I want to ask you all about America and the ship ride. But but first I want to ask, um, your family is from Marash, right? Oh, my father is from Marash. My mother is from Harpe. So my mother was had gone to Euphrates College in Harpe. And Euphrates College is well known. If you know the Armenian history, you know that a lot of people have graduated. You know, all, uh, and all there were, most of the teachers were Americans. So my mother could speak very good Armenian and she helped us with our Armenian. But my father, not much, because Marash Antap, they were all spoke Turkish. So his Armenian wasn't that great. In fact, my mother helped him to learn Armenian. Yeah. So, uh, but my father, if you read his life here, he wanted to go after he graduated from Marash College and Antop, he wanted to go to England and study in England. In those days, people didn't travel and go all the way to England to study, but he did. And he always liked the uh, British people, their culture, uh, the way they carry things out. Uh, you know, he was very fond of the British people. Not as much with Edinburgh. The, Edinburgh. 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 Yeah, in Scotland. Scotland. He studied in Scotland. But uh, my uh, father didn't care as much <laughs> for the Americans. Because he said there are 77 kind of nations that have gone to America. It's too mixed, too, too many different people. Why in England we don't have that many. It's more clear English people. And he liked their culture, the way they treated the ladies. He, he liked that very much. And uh, after that, he was very active in the Armenian Missionary Association. And he was uh, very um, helpful with building churches. Um, he was very active. He always, he built the churches. He was in the bar, uh, the monasteries. In, uh, in Aleppo, they, they had different people coming from different parts of um, you know Turkey. There are the Marashis, there are the Antab, there are the Harpers. They all have organizations and they used to meet every so often. So he was very active in the Marashis. 
Yeah, and in the churches, he wanted to be very active. And besides that, he was very active in the old people's home. There was no old people's home for the Armenians. He was very active in the committee to build a home. And afterwards, they built a new building in a very good section. When we came to the States, they used to send me some leaflets and things saying that the government, whenever somebody comes to Syria, right away they want to take them to the Armenian old people's home so they can see how far advanced they are with everything. So he was very active in the nation and in the church too. <laughs> and naturally, we followed him more or less whatever he did, you know, in staying active in churches or organizations until we came to the States. Of course, here, we were very active here too, but we had to think about making a livelihood. So I came with my brother. My brother is their father. I asked him about your father, like when he first became a minister and what happened to him. So yeah, sorry. and the way Armenians lived okay. and how they were treated in uh, general, before the genocide. Before the genocide. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know too much about that part because I was not born then. I didn't live with them in uh, Turkey. I don't know anything about Turkey. It's what they have been telling or I've been hearing or reading like you people are hearing from me. But I know that um, he was, when they started troubling the Armenians in, uh, in Turkey, he was, they thought that he had something to do with the prizings of the Armenians he said, I had nothing to do. I, I don't know anything about it. But again, they got him and they put him in prison. He was prisoned several times. They uh, asked him, they showed him a piece of paper with names on it. I, that they think that those young people were the ones that started the trouble in uh, Turkey. And he said, I don't know anything about it and I can't sign anything about it, but you send me uh, to uh, prison, I will go to prison. And they really tortured him very much. My mother says that one of his shirt's buttons, they had, uh, really tortured him so much, uh, you know, by hitting him, that one of the buttons had entered in his body. That's, uh, he was really tortured so many times, but he said, you can do anything to me, but I can't write and say that, yes, I know who started this business against the Turkish government. I had no part in it, but if you want to send me, I will go. And that's what happened. But afterwards, he succeeded to get out from Turkey and come to Aleppo. Mm -hmm. And that's where he started. The Armenians were coming by groups and groups and groups with nowhere to go. And a lot of them were coming and they wanted to get into uh, Reverend Shirajan's uh, orphanage. They had heard that my father has an orphanage and they wanted to come and live in the orphanage. So that's where I was born uh, as a young kid and I grew up there. Wow. <laughs> Before we go to the orphanage, um, your father, do you know when he became um, a minister? My mother? Your father. Like how, yeah. when did he become a minister in, in Harper? 
No, oh, Mara. No, no, sorry. No. Mara. 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 Did, when he went to Mara. England, that was, I mean, to Edinburgh. My father went to school in Maharaj, and he graduated there. And afterwards, he wanted to go and advance his uh, education. And that's when he went to, wanted to go to England, which very few people in those days traveled that far, you know, not too many. And he wanted to go because there were theological schools in, Gla in uh, 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 Glasgow, uh, and he went there and he graduated from there. Wow. And, and he returned he in 1894. Did they have a question? Doesn't they have a question? Oh, no, so I was going to ask you if you knew when he went. Oh, he went to uh, graduate in Maharaj um, Theological Seminary in 1889. Wow. Okay. He graduated about 1911 or 1913 from University of Edinburgh Theological Seminary. Um, I went there. They didn't have <laughs> yearbooks wow. from those few years. You're right, George. 1912 for that, for postgraduate well, work in Edinburgh. Wow. And I have a question. You said your mother was also educated and she went to university. Do you know how common it was for women to go to school? Well, in Harpeth, uh, there were quite a few. In fact, the, their organization was well known. Uh, the, the ones that graduated from Euphrates, the name was Euphrates College. And as I said, the teachers were, a lot of them were Americans. Uh, and, uh, but my mother was married to, a, he, my mother graduated. She had, her uh, thing was being a teacher uh, to the primary school, mostly kindergarten children. And when she got married first, before my, she married my father, her husband was a graduate too. They were both graduates. They were both teaching in Harpeth when they were exiled. But all the um, educated men were got together, if you know the history and they were all lined up and they were all killed so she was like a widow my mother was a widow with two little kids my sister was about three or four years old and she was pregnant so they pushed them out from turkey she lost her husband they killed her husband. All the well-educated people were all lined up and they shoot them all. This was the beginning of the genocide, right? This is in Turkey. Yeah, yeah, but this is the beginning of the genocide. When you're-, yeah. you're Before the, yeah, 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 genocide those years, yeah. yeah. So tell them about where Mezbama and um, Rose's mom, what happened to them? Who? Rosa's mom. Oh, mom. Oh, Rosa's mom. Oh, well, she. So they they were they were they the were desert. they were torn out from Turkey too, but different groups because right. they didn't live all yeah. in the same city. Right, but what happened? They had to walk across the desert. Well, right? they they all ended up in our in Aleppo. Yeah, what was what, their experience between leaving their home yeah. and Aleppo? What happened between that? When well, they the as different groups came to uh, your, yeah. family. Your, yeah, family. your family, different groups came to Aleppo. What happened to your mother when she crossed the desert? Remember what how happened? she lost her son? Oh, yeah. What and, was it like? and she, I said she was my mother was pregnant. She had the little girl, my sister. This is the girl that lived in Connecticut and she came to pick us up. But her brother, which was uh, 
Oh, no, no, she was not pregnant. She had the baby. The son was about eight or nine months old. No, eight or nine yeah, months he was old. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, eight or nine months old. But was so, uh, son, the son hated him. And my mother says, I didn't have any milk to give him. There was no milk. The baby was crying constantly. So he says, he died. So we, she says, we dug a hole, and at least we put him in the hole. Because there were a lot of kids running around looking for their mothers. But there was, the mothers would just about walk or the soldiers will come and hit them and saying you have to keep up with the group you can't stay behind so that there were a lot of kids that were just running around no one was taking care of them he says at least i know that we buried my son you know she was very happy about that and then she came to the orphanage and they told my meanwhile my father's first husband was taking care of orphan kids. These orphan kids, wife. you know, first wife. First they wife. were all kinds of children, but they were all getting sick, you know. They were typhus. They didn't have any medication. So my father's first wife contacted typhus while she was taking care of the orphan kids and she died so he was a widow and my mother was a widower came to the orphanage and they told my mother uh, my they told my father you know there is a nice minister's wife who came from Harpeth. she's a very educated woman she will be just right for you why don't you two get married? <laughs> so <laughs> they took that by the right setup. They got married, and then my brother was born, which is their father, and we are the last two. Before that, <laughs> there is seven. Wow. There's seven of them. They're all gone now. They're not around. They were all married. They're all gone. <laughs> But so that's how uh, it ended up that they got married, but they had gone through a lot during the massacre. Did, did okay, father, let's pause. Yeah, did your father tell you about how he escaped and got to Aleppo? No, his my journey? father was such a busy man. He was in so many organizations. Wait, wait, ask the question again. Oh, yeah, did, did, your father, did he tell you about how he escaped? and got out of Marash and came to Aleppo, the journey? Your father, you? your father. Yes, is, what happens is, did he tell you about uh, his life evidently? No, no. How did he escape from that Turkey? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I Grace, don't know uh, why don't, why don't you, you, can you send him the picture as an Arab? Can you send them a picture as an Arab? Yeah, I can send, yeah. but Auntie, you were telling me that um, during their deportation, they were actually I, kind of well because because of his um, stature, because he was so well respected that you, they didn't have to walk the desert. He, I think you had they had horses and carriages. You remember uh, that? your father yeah. got out early. Your father he was tortured many times in Turkey. Yes, and he was he allowed tortured. to leave on his own with his family. He was not deported through the desert. Like your grandma. Like right. your mother, my, my mother. Yeah, he did not go through that. His deportation was a, more simple. Oh. Yes. With the older kids. I don't know that part too well, but I know that he came. Uh, and this is how it ended up. Okay, let's pause here for a moment. Okay, so the one thing I can, I can say to you about mm -hmm. Aharon, is when he did get to Aleppo, remember, it was still under the Ottoman Empire as well. And, um, but he kept a very low profile and he masqueraded as an Arab. 
So he dressed as an Arab regularly. Um, and Grace will send you a photo of that, which is very interesting. Oh, the main uh, when he dressed up as a yeah uh, yeah. You know, this Arab. is like inside the lab. Yeah. Yeah. In, yes. Because while he was in Aleppo, exactly. And he did manage to get his his wife and his seven children all intact um, to Aleppo. We don't know the details. I, I guess she doesn't remember the details. But th that's about all that Grace and I can that's documented. Actually, I can know. tell you, right, Grace? What? What? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think Denise might know more about that. What did you say, Rita? Does it, would Denise know more? Denise Darmanian. I'm asking the same question. Would Denise Darmanian know? No. I don't think so. I think uh, okay. Grace got all the information which she kept sending me. Yeah. I so a... um, there was an American, I forget, some, I don't know if it was Near East folks or whatever, but documented in a Brooklyn newspaper about uh, a little, little bit about this, the tortures, and then a, a I don't know about the escape though, mm. but Grace, if you could send that, you have that in your folio. Mm. Yeah. He wrote him in his memoir, he wrote about his um, six months in prison in 1895. Um, and that wasn't the only time he was in there, but that was the longest time. Wow. And the, the, is the memoir, like, do you have mm. the, full, the full memoir? Yeah, it's, it's oh. a, a type document, like eight pages or something like that I can send you. Wow. But she did tell me, I, I'm pretty sure she told me, um, but it's written somewhere too. It was in a, a couple books. There's, he's written about it in many books. And in one of the books, it said that he, he it was a relatively um, uh, painless, if you want to say it that way, uh, trip to Aleppo because he was escorted out didn't, on horseback and carriage. They didn't have to you know, walk on foot and suffer hardship or anything. Yeah. Did they know, was it like the Turkish authorities that let him out or he had other connections? Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was a question. One of the leaders there. Oh. Yeah. And did he ever explain why he felt he needed to masquerade as an Arab? It's clear that, you know, because it was still under Ottoman Empire, but, but did he explain, I guess, what it was like doing that or why he felt the need to do that? Or did he not talk much about it? She can answer that, but um, it was to to escape, um, to uh, so that he wouldn't be noticed. He could he could go about town. He could go outside without being noticed and without being harassed. More security thing. And and mm -hmm. and particularly, he he was a pastor, right? Or is I mixing them up? He was a pastor. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if particularly like suppressing his religion, if he felt any kind of um, moral un uncalmness about that? I don't know if it was the religion part. I think it was more the ethnicity. Okay. But um, Joy, ask Auntie if you want. Yeah. When, when, um, when your father had to masquerade as an Arab, yeah. what was his motivation? What was he scared of? Well, uh, there were some people watching him too. Mm -hmm. You know, look uh, at them and answer them. Yeah. Uh, first of all, when he was dressed up as an Arab, the, uh, when he went to buy food for the orphans, they would respect him very much. They uh, and they would call him, "Come, come to my store." Everybody wanted him to go to their store to them because he would buy a lot. You know for to feed 100 people, and there were some people coming with him. No, they didn't have cars, and they had baskets, big baskets, to carry all the food to the orphanage. You know, so they all called him. They, they said, come to me, come to me. They, when they, whenever he entered the markets, which were called souks, they were closed in some of the tops, they would, everybody would try to get him his attention. So they would, and he would come and buy from them, you know, from him. And, uh, and they would, uh, of course, uh, they regarded him very highly because he was all dressed up as a Turkish man. <laughs>
Um, but I think they had some people who were watching him too. Among the Syrians, they were like spies. So they were following him very close to see what he would do in Syria. If he would start another, uh, maybe a revolution or what, they, uh, they were detecting him. And did he, because he had studied in, in um, Britain, did he have a lot of connections with the, like some foreign uh, missionaries and people from maybe the US or from Europe? You know? Joy Arita? There, she's uh, asking if he had many connections with the, 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 the British and the Americans. Well, the British helped to carry on the orphanage. Oh, let me tell you that. If it wasn't, they were, friend, they were known as a society known as Friends of Armenia. And the Armenians used to make beautiful broderies. Oh, doilies. Oh, you have the doilies there? Doilies, handkerchiefs, tablecloths, uh, pillowcases, whatever you can think of. And we would ship them to England. They would buy them and send the money. This is how she, he used to uh, be able to carry all the needs of the, those hundred girls. If he, it wasn't for Friends of Armenia, I don't think he had any means of any income to support these orphanages or, or this orphanage and uh, supply everything for them. They had a very good life. If it wasn't for the Friends of Armenia, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. We used to send big parcels like this, all beautiful handkerchiefs, dollies, uh, all kinds of embroidery. They would send the measurements, you know. Even now, if you go to England, I bet in a lot of homes you can find some of these beautiful handworks that was done by the Armenians. And so that's how they could carry the orphanage. Okay, uh, let them, let's pause. Uh, we have other questions. Yeah. Um, um, you wanna ask, I have a question. Go ahead, Ami. Oh, um, do you know, maybe you don't know, but do you know, did your father, was his goal to eventually maybe, sorry, let me re-ask. Did your father think eventually Armenians could go back to their homelands or was he sort of having this orphanage to rebuild the Armenian community in Aleppo, do you know? You mean he wanted to go back to Turkey? Did he Turkey? think it was a possibility to go back? No, uh, he never talked about going back to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Now they, they didn't have such a good life in Turkey that they said, oh, we wish we would go back. <laughs> they, <laughs> they didn't have a very nice life in Turkey. Why go back? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then they knew that most of their, uh, his classmates and all his friends, they were all uh, thrown out from Turkey. There was yeah. nobody that they cared about anymore. Yeah. And did he think it would be possible for Armenians to build a new community in Aleppo? Or he thought maybe it'd be difficult in a non, like, in an Arab country. Did they, did, uh, did the Armenians and your father feel like there was a future in Aleppo for Armenians? Or was it just a limbo to get through to somewhere else? Well, you know, they didn't have... <laughs> uh, I think that uh, it was at least quiet. No one was... Uh, doing anything to them. Uh, that maybe came to them afterwards that they could improve their life by going somewhere else. But for all those years that they could keep the orphanage alive and have these Armenians get settled was a big, big job. 
it wasn't easy, believe me. But yeah, tell okay. them what, what did your father do to help Armenians build homes in Syria? Tell huh? them about that, what your father did. My my father, yeah. I said he was a minister. No, no. let's uh, so yeah. he actually did some work to create an Armenian community in Aleppo. Not like a let's get the heck out of here. No, he, he I was saying he was members of so many organizations. Every He had a meeting to go. Okay, let's, yeah, what did he do? And tell oh, them. that's at the end. Yes. At the end, after all these things, when Armenians came to Aleppo, they built little huts, you know, of um, tin, metal, then, or wood, nothing fancy. And they were in the middle of the city, in the city. And uh, they had no irrigation, running water in their homes. They would go out, there might be a fountain somewhere very close by, they would bring water. You know, the government said, no, this can't go on. These Armenians have to leave the city. We can't have these shacks in the city. So the three uh, religious people from the three churches got together and they said, okay, what we would do, get some help and buy some land out of the city and then let the Armenians come buy the land and build their homes. So they bought big lots big, big lots, three lots, three different sections of the city. And because the government said, you have so much time or else everything is coming down. We don't want you in the middle of the city. This is not healthy for the city people. So they used to come and buy land, but the two other the little Orchagan and the Catholic Armenian, their priests, <laughs> their higher ups, they said, no, 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 you don't get involved in this. That's very, very hard work, very complicated. You have to withdraw from that. So everything was left on my poor father. And every morning we would wake up and we'd see our courtyard full of people. They had come to buy land. They would have their maps and they would say, oh, okay, we'll buy this, we'll buy that, you know. Each one would pay something and they were supposed to pay gradually for the land. But what happened was <laughs> my father had hired two men to go and collect for the money for the land. They would give him a little bit, but he said, <laughs> this two men used to say, you know, uh, Reverend, we see they have added a room, but when it comes to the land money, they won't give us to bring it to you. <laughs> they would say, let the minister write to Europe and ask for help. <laughs> and my father said, how many times can I write and ask for money? They won't give me any more. You have to work and give money. You, why did you build up room after room and you can't pay for the land? <laughs> because those were Muslim people. And I remember I saw that they came to the house all the husbands and their wives, they're all Muslims, you know, with their Muslim ways and everything. And they had got some money, they gave it to them in the beginning. But afterwards, they gave my father a hard time, you know, that they you And then my mother said, how long are we going to put up with this? 
the land is there. They have all the means. Let them set their own government people or their workers and ask for the money and give it to them because we're going to come to America. They said, why are we getting so involved in this? But because it was his wife, they thought that maybe she had money. We didn't have any money. <laughs> in fact, the minute that he died, they came and they sealed everything in his office. The, so they could go through all the papers to see what he had. And my, one of my older sisters said to my mother, well, when you saw that she had some, that your father, that your husband had some money, some gold pounds, why didn't you leave them in the desk drawer? You, you know that you had two children, they were orphans, and who was going to support them? You should have taken that. But my mother was, oh no, that's stealing money. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't take anything. So, well, then, then we continued the hand, this handwork business. We were selling them. They were coming, taking. We were giving them material and the thread and everything and telling them what to do. And they would work, not only for the orphans, are the outside Armenians. They used to come, the ladies, a lot of them would come and take, you know, material and uh, thread and everything and work, bring it so we could sell and make a living on that until we came to the States. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, were you going to add something, Joy? No, no, I wanted to stop her so you could ask a question. Uh, okay, I wanted to ask, um, with, with the orphanage, if any Armenian organizations were helping. I think Grace earlier had said the Near Eastern Relief Society was helping. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask if the, if those organizations are the ones who decided, okay, we're going to put an, an orphanage in place and your father run it, or if your father said, I'm going to start an orphanage and then it, other organizations helped. I really don't know just how this Near East, um, the Armenians, uh, this company, uh, friends of Armenia, how did they came to help my father? That I don't know. But they were the they were backing my father. I know that. If it wasn't for them, I don't think my father would have been able to carry on all that big burden on him. They were great help. I know that. And it was, and then. We have some missionaries coming from Britain or from America. They used to come to the orphanage to see how he was running the orphanage and what was the orphanage like, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of company like that. And it was your father's idea to create it? And also, what was the name of it? That I don't know how this Friends of Armenia came in the picture. Before that, he had an orphanage for boys. I think the AGBU took it over. Okay, Afterwards, yeah, what was the question again? Was uh, the two questions were, what was the name of the orphanage? And then also, was it her father who created the orphanage or was it already established by AGBU, et cetera? Ladies orphanage. It was my father who created, uh, back, because the orphans were coming, nowhere to go. The groups and groups of Armenians were coming from Turkey, nowhere to go. So when he gave up the other boys' orphanage, they opened up the girls' orphanage, which was known as, uh, they used to call it Babilish Shirajan's orphanage. That's how it was known. And or... Uh, Grace, do you remember the name? Hostel. Armenian National Orphanage. Mm -hmm. And do you know, was the orphanage in the center of the city where people were coming or it was in those outside areas? Well, it wasn't in the middle of the city, but it was in one section of the city, which was a good section, more or less. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of the area? 
Well, it was the they used to call the Bad Valley's orphanage. You know the neighborhood. Uh, Do you know the neighborhood? Uh, well, Azizie. Azizie. Okay, yeah, we've yeah. heard that because we we interview a lot of people who are like have been there till very recently, and that's where a lot of them live. So, yeah. And Do you know that section? Do you know if it was mostly orphans from a certain area of Turkey? Like, were they mostly coming from Marash and Aintap? Or was it all over? They were coming. We had girls coming from every part of the Turkey. It wasn't just one or two. It was from every part of the uh, Turkey. They didn't have anyone to go. They didn't know what to do. They would come uh, to the church. Uh, you know, every church had a big courtyard. They would come there. If people knew that their relatives have come from Turkey, they would come and pick them up. But some of them didn't have anyone to go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. Uh, or first, actually, Grace or Joy, can somebody answer if he created it himself or if it was already created by an organization? He created it himself. He created okay. it himself, yeah. Okay, and then... My the orphanage, friend, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. My, 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 don't worry about that. My, my question now is... Um, yeah, uh, I'm curious why, if you know, why did some people decide to stay in Syria while others left? Because Syria was a destination that a lot of Armenians left and went to Greece and Egypt. Well, if you had people anywhere else, like some people, like my, one of my aunts was in America then. He had graduated already and he had come to America. So... Uh, he kept writing to my mother and the sisters. He was, she was trying to make them come to America. I mean, that was her intention. But some of them didn't have no one. So, Auntie, the question is not just, um, not just your father and your family, but in general, do you know the sentiment of Armenians? Did Armenians think about Aleppo as let's get out of here as soon as we can? Or did they think there's a possibility of being an Armenian successfully here? Well, as I said, if they had friends or relatives that would back them up, they would come up from the orphanage. So I think you're saying that nobody, from your perspective, you don't think people looked at Aleppo as a future. No, there were some that they didn't know anything about going anywhere else. Right. So you're saying, are you yeah. saying then if they could get to the West, they would hightail yeah, it to the West? Would, yeah, if there was any means of getting out of Syria. Yeah. So they well, didn't like the idea of Syria? Is that what you're saying? No, they didn't in particular say that. But if they had a chance, they would come out but they didn't have anyone. And why, why do you think that is, that, that if they had a chance they would leave? Is it because they didn't like living in the Middle East or they didn't like living with Arabs or, or just they thought there was more opportunity somewhere else? Well, some of them, as I said, they didn't have anyone who really helped them to come out. Now listen, Auntie, the question is, these the folks made it to Syria. Yeah. A lot of them chose to leave some of them chose to stay. What was the motivation for staying versus leaving? Right? So if, let's say, are you saying that everybody who had someone in the West wanted to go to the West? Was that the only thing people wanted? Or did some people say, even if I have a cousin in France, yeah. who cares about those crazies? I'm going to stay in Aleppo. This is a good place. No, if they had good friends or family members who were interested in them too. You know, it has to be from both sides. Yeah. If they were interested in their families or nieces, nephews, whatever, they would like to come out. But if they didn't have any, also... Okay, and mean? let's okay. ask this question that, that Anush was asking. Why would people prefer to leave Aleppo if they had the opportunity to leave? Was it because 
they were scared to stay in an Arab place? Was it because they felt there was no economic and social opportunity? I don't think they really thought about that part. It was, now they were saved from Turkey. They have gone through such difficult times that as long as they had a secure place to live, they didn't think about uh, Syria being an Arab country and all that. As long as they made a living there or they got food and job. So for the time being, they did. But afterwards, as life went on and they heard more about different countries, how people were living, probably then they wanted to get out. And do you know? Oh. I do. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Besides family, did you do you know if the any of the missionary organizations helped take people to Europe or to the United States? Like, would they help any of the orphan orphans go to England, for example? Not then, because uh, eventually they got organized. So those organizations from different. Uh, parts of Turkey that came, like the Marashis, Eintracht, Bolsenses, uh, you know, and then they tried to help them. They did, if they could, because in the beginning they didn't have any tomb themselves. How could they help when they didn't have anything? But as they get, got along, they got jobs, they started trying to help their young generation. Help them like in Syria or help them to leave? No, uh, help them in Syria. But if, as I said, if they had family members in different countries and they were interested in them and they were keeping corresponding with them, fine. And they tried to get them out of Syria. Eventually, they wanted to get them, like in France, there were a lot of Armenians that went to France or in Greece you know, those neighboring countries, Iran, Iraq, there were a lot of Armenians mm -hmm. and they made pretty good in those countries. Yeah. And then I was going to, oh, Syria is too, they, as they went ahead, all those Armenians, when they came, they didn't have anything. But then when I got a little older and I heard so much about this uh, Syrian markets, that one after each other, all armies, just like here, there's a section of them all goldsmiths, or section when or they're all shoemakers, Goshkagar, you know, or Tetzat. They were all armies, they had stores, and they were doing very good. Yeah. Um, and I was gonna say, you yourself, when you were living in Aleppo, did you interact with non-Armenians at all? Or were you mainly just with the Armenians in the orphanage? No, I was friendly. I had all kinds of friends. I, uh, I went to Armenian primary school. Then from there, I went to American high school. Well, I was in American high school, there were girls from all over, all from all the churches, because then, before that, the French was in great demand. Mm -hmm. They wanted to learn French. But then in 48, uh, the British came and took over, um, you know, Syria. And the uh, English language was domineering. And everybody, everybody wanted to learn English. So they used to come to the American school. So these were, were these Arabs? coming to no, the school? No, I mean, Armenians all, all, all from all different churches and Muslims. Okay. Uh, Jewish people. Okay. From all nationalities. Wow. I mean, in the American University, there were all different kinds of girls from different nationalities. Even though our teachers were American, everything was in English. And what they literally came to learn English. They thought that English will be the domineering language in all the world. Before that, it was French. Should have bought stock in it. 
Uh, apparently, Aranush had a certain weakness for the British troops. <laughs> <laughs> and what were you called? Fussy Pants? Mrs. What was your name? Mrs. F Miss Fussy Pants? <laughs> Which one? Mrs. Fusscott? What was your, what were the, the British soldiers like to call you? Oh, they, they, they were the ones they gave me the, my middle name. They were Australians. Oh, Australians. Yeah, Australians. And one of them said, oh, you remind me of my wife. I will call you never by your Armenian. <laughs> they used to call me Vivian. Okay. Her name was Vivian. They were very, very nice people. Australians were very good. New Zealanders were very good. Uh, but Australians, they had, <laughs> they used to drink a lot. <laughs> they still do, Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> and they would, they would, a lot of them would get picked up by the uh, Syrian sold, you know, guards at night. They didn't want any soldiers to be out drinking. <laughs> But New Zealanders didn't drink too much, you know. They were very nice people, very nice. We had an experience. We had the French in the beginning. During the war, the French left, the British came over. So we had the British too. But they were very good. Those Syrians were jolly people, very happy people. New Zealanders were more reserved. Still that way. Okay, you have more questions? Yeah, I'm wondering um, if she, or I don't know, I'm wondering if you um, made any friends in the orphanage that you like remember very well. Did you? Oh, for a while, I had a lot of friends. We used to write to each other, but uh, you know, in the beginning when I came over, I was still young. I had a lot of friends I had left behind. We, I used to correspond with them, but now, when you get old, <laughs> many of them were at the Church of Providence, huh? though. Some of them came to the Church of Providence, so you kept in touch with them. Yeah, some um, people stay. Some people came to Providence, so you did not lose them from the orphanage. Yeah, like Peggy's father, Sam. Who? Sam Boyajian. He was in the orphanage. Sam Boyajian's husband. Husband was in the first orphanage. Oh, in the boys' orphanage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you said that people would be writing to see if their family members would accept them. So everything was done, of course, by mail. And just how long would that take to, to write and, and hear back from somebody in Europe uh, from Syria? Do you know? Sorry, that was very convoluted. Joy, I don't know if you understood my question. Okay, I'll try. So what people was... would write people from Syria, Aleppo, yeah. would write to their their um, relatives. their relatives in the West, yeah. and they would say, "Hey, you know, can you bring me? Yeah, to the can you sponsor me? Yeah." What was the the time lag between sending that letter and getting acknowledgement back from their relatives to say, "Yeah, we're willing to do that." Was this something that you would hear back within a month? Would it be three months before it all they would respond? It depends on the family, how, what their feelings were towards their relatives. Yeah. If they felt close enough, they that. would write right away and they would start working on their papers. You also, know. how did they find each other? Because I'm sure it's hard to know what address somebody's at. Yeah. How would they know that they were in the orphanage or would the person that was in the orphanage know where they lived? Yeah. How did they know? Yeah, that? so so some girl from Marash Kharpet would get to Aleppo, and um, after a few years, she would say, um, "I know, I ha I believe I have relatives who have survived or maybe got out before this." How oh. would they find these? Some people? of them would put it in the papers, and that that's how they would find too. Yeah, not Armenian that. papers or no. Yeah. They would be in our uh, Armenian papers and uh, American papers, so they would carry names so that they could find their relatives. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you have another question? Um, I have questions outside of Syria, so if you want to keep asking about Syria, yeah. did you ask her already if she went to Armenian school? Yeah, I was kind of going to ask about that kind of thing. Yeah, so 
I was gonna ask, you said, um, so you went to Armenian school. Did, okay. did you speak other languages growing up? Because you said your father spoke Turkish. Did you speak Arabic too outside the orphanage? Well, we had to take, uh, anybody that goes to school has to take Arabic, just like anyone that comes here goes and has to take English. That's a country's language. You have to, it's a very hard language, let me tell you. <laughs> I didn't like, that was one, <laughs> one topic I didn't like was the Arabic language. And yet, some of my friends came from sections of the city where their neighbors were all Arabic. They could speak fluently and they did it very good. But we were not among, uh, we, we, our section was all Armenian. We didn't have a chance to learn from the streets. <laughs> yeah, so, and then did, um, so did you feel comfortable speaking Arabic? Like if you went to a store or you went out? Or a little bit that I knew I could, you know, say a few words, but I, I could, we had to take French in school, English, and Armenian. Armenian wow. was the, especially in the primary, even in the, um, yeah, even in the high school, we had Armenian yet. It was more like, uh, uh, advanced Armenia. In the um, in the American high school or in Armenian high school? Yeah, in the American school, everything else was all in English, like arithmetic, geography, uh, whatever we had was done in English. But did you have Armenian instruction at the Armenian yeah, yeah. at the American, American school? school? Yes, yeah. there was one class, one class okay. only. Wow. Uh, what was the name of the Armenian school? What was it? What was the name of the Armenian school? Oh, Avadiranagan uh, Evangelical, Armenian Evangelical School, Emmanuel. Oh, yeah, we, we heard people talk about yeah. Emmanuel. Yeah, and was that connected to the orphanage? There was, by that name, there was a, every Armenian church or every other Armenian church had their school too. You know, they all went to uh, for grammar school. They all went to Armenian. Uh, primary school was all Armenian. Did you start languages at the fourth grade to teach you a little bit in the fourth grade. And then from there you go to high school. Yeah, and um, your, you said, so your father mainly spoke Turkish. Um, Oh yeah, sometimes Did a lot of the orphans only speak Turkish. Saying that they were their language was Turkish, they would right away speak Turkish, you know, and uh, because they felt so much at home speaking the language. Because even in their schools, they had to, they were taught in Turkish, wow. and uh, you don't hear that. Uh, say you go to uh, school. Uh, here or in Lebanon, you know, to become a minister, you still have to, you don't hear uh, that they teach them in Turkish or in French, but over there they do. Yeah, and did, did you speak Turkish or no? I can speak. Speak a lot of languages. <laughs> do any one of you speak Turkish? No. <laughs> No, I only know oh, one you word. Want, you <laughs> what is it? Is what, it a bad is, one? What is yeah. the word? Huh? That was a fresh word. <laughs> I think it, 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 it's a yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that's that. A, that's, 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 that's checkers in French. That's uh, Armenian. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. oh, Esh. I heard Esh. Yeah. No, I, I thought it meant donkey. No, yeah, Ash yeah. means donkey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, but I said Eshek. No, okay. Eshek. Someone told me it was Turkish. Oh, I thought it was Armenian my whole life. <laughs> but, uh, You're probably all right. Um, <laughs> you don't know any other word? No, I wanted to ask you to speak some Turkish to us. Yeah, Nasusun. Let me see. Hey, hello. Nasusun. Nasus, um, how are you? 
Oh, good is, um, no, I don't know good. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to because we used to hear a lot. We didn't take that in school. No Turkish in schools. But people used to speak and we would catch up, you know, learn from them. Yeah. And did you feel, I know you said when you went to school, there was Muslim students, Jewish students. Christian well, in my high school yes did you feel that like all the different communities were very accepted in Syria but see when you went to high American school the main language was English you had to speak yeah. English L listen even to her though, question listen to her question even <laughs> though they were Muslims and they were uh, Jewish girls yeah. they were all different kinds of nationalities but the language was English okay auntie they have a special question for you yeah yeah so all oh, go ahead yeah do you feel that in Aleppo all these other ethnic groups yeah the non-Syrian ethnic groups yeah. were they accepted were they treated well oh yeah oh they had no problem about that they used to treat them very well. Yeah. No, they wouldn't say, oh, you Turkey, or oh, you Jewish, or oh, you Muslim. No, everybody had their own uh, uh, community, their own churches. They went there, you know. Now, the Jewish girls wouldn't come to my church. I wouldn't go to their church. But how, mm -hmm. would, the, how would the Syrians treat? all these minorities no, they, they treated them very well okay no problem i have a yeah i have a follow-up question um how did the government treat how did you feel the government was treating you did you feel that the government was limiting how armenian you could be no, like well, did they limit how much you could learn armenian did they limit how much you could go to church did, were there any limits you felt from the government on being armenian you know, they were very good to uh, to everybody. They really didn't differentiate or didn't say, oh, this is a Jewish group or this is a Muslim group. Uh, they didn't do that. If you were uh, educated enough to have a job in the government, they would take you. Even I've the, I, I heard that a lot of the girls that were went to school with me afterwards went and got government jobs. And you said before you talked about how there was French soldiers and then the British soldiers. Did you feel like a lot of difference between the French and then when Syria became independent and there was like different presidents of Syria? Like was, did you well, notice a lot I, of- people? I didn't live that far. Oh, okay. In Syria to know that oh. because we came to the States. Oh, well, before the independence? You experienced, you experienced the, the, the Anglophones coming, the, the, the British and the Australians. You were there when the French left yes. and the British and Australians came. They came, yes. And so the question is, can you restate the question? Oh, when, yeah. When, when, I guess when that change happened, did that affect your life a lot? Did you notice a lot of differences? No, there wasn't that much of a difference, really. And then I was, my section was mostly Armenians. <laughs> I didn't mingle too much with the Muslims or the Jewish, you know, except when I went to high school and I had some nice girls from some nice Jewish girls, very smart girls. Were in, <laughs> the Muslims weren't that smart. <laughs> and I mean, I, the Muslim girls, they, they had a hard time with their pro projects. But uh, the, these girls came from French schools, uh, the Jewish girls. They were very, very smart, uh, really. Um, overall, they got along well. We didn't have any that kind of trouble. But now they're having different kinds of troubles. I know, I hear about it. But those days, no. Yeah, and then I just have one more question. But before, a while ago, you said they used to watch your father to see what he was doing. Yeah. Uh, did you feel like some people were afraid Armenians would try to make their own community or like want their own sort of like power inside Syria? Is that what they were afraid of? With your yeah, I, I think because 
he was a well-known person. They thought maybe he had, he could start something, you know. That's why, and because he was sent to prison in Maras, you know, they thought that maybe he is in politics or underhand he was doing something to start a revolution. Who knows? What and that, was, that was still during the Ottoman, when Ottomans still controlled Aleppo? What was when, Was the Ottoman government watching him in Aleppo? I don't know who were the spies. I don't know, but I know they were watching him very closely. Wow. Uh, I have a question um, about, you said that now you see things are are bad for people in Syria that, that you're, li you're listening to the news and uh, I'm and, and hearing from friends and I'm wondering if if you think in any way what's happening now in Syria to the Armenians having to leave is similar to the genocide. It's not as bad as the genocide. No, I don't think that will never happen, or else they will really revolt. You know, the people can't stand genocide anymore. But uh, there might be some things that are not good because if you read the papers or follow the news, there's always something going on in every country, just like here. You have so many uh, re people revolting. We have here the blacks and the whites, you know, Every country has its own problems. You can find a safe country with no problem. Switzerland is one country that I have never heard of. Uh, Schwed, Norway, Norway. This, uh, those countries are very nice countries. I, I don't think I hear any, any problems from those countries. Very nice, but big countries like Russia, big country like uh, China, America, you hear some problem and you go, you have to expect some problems because it's not one kind of a race. It's too much mixed races here. That's and why you get this problem. It was all Americans would have been a different story. When you came to America, did it feel very different to you? Like that now you were amongst all different kinds of people, new, like a new, new groups of people? Well, it wasn't that much emphasized in those days when we first came. People got along very well. We never heard of uprisings, but it's just lately that you hear a lot. Yeah. And did you feel like people accepted you in America, people who were already here? They accepted me. Were they welcoming they, you? Yeah. yeah, my family accepted me. No, 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 the, the Americans yeah. who are already here. Yeah, no, no, they were very good to me. Mm -hmm. I had no problem from Americans. Yeah, and one no, thing we hear, no one thing we hear a lot is that in Syria, people preserve speaking Armenian, like, really well, even to, like, our young generation in Syria, they might speak fluent Armenian. And here in America, a lot of people have, have lost Armenian or they don't speak it as well. Did you notice that difference when you came to America that maybe the Armenian community wasn't as strong or the Armenian language wasn't as strong here? Well, they have brought up here with different ideals. Uh, you know, of course, they have their own ideals uh, are different. Uh, so you, you trust that their ideals are good and it leads them to the right things, to do the right things. So auntie, yeah. maybe a, be, a different way of asking this is, you brought up your children and you spoke English to them. Well, but when you went to Syria, your parents made sure to speak Armenian to you. Actually, we spoke Armenian. You spoke very, very little. You, you it know, was not reinforced for years. Right. My husband, yeah. Dean, my husband was from Israel. He was brought up on, he went to French school. His French was his top language. 
and English, Arabic, Yiddish, but not Ar Armenian. He knew how to speak, but he couldn't read and write because he never went to Armenian school. They didn't send him. So I could speak to them Armenian. They understand quite a bit, but they can't read or write. I feel very bad about that, but there was nothing I could do. It's very hard. Did your parents teach you Armenian or you went to school and learn? I went to school to learn, yeah. My Where parents. were you born? In Philadelphia. Okay, and you? New York. Oh, and did you go to Armenian school there? You yeah. did? Just for a few years. How did you learn? Huh? Oh, I, I went to Saturday school for one or two years, and then I, in college with Ani, um, I created a class for myself, but I, I didn't learn that much. She's good. Oh. <laughs> but it's yeah. hard it's hard here yeah. it's really hard it's yeah and my parents they speak to each other but they never spoke to us yeah this that's what it is if both husband and wife know armenian how to speak how to write and all that then it's easy to teach them otherwise it's very hard because like my son we were he was the first born. We were more successful with him than with Rita because the minute he came home from school, they would start speaking English to each other. And after a while, we could never control them. <laughs> and you, you, got, you met your husband in, in America? Well, he, he's dead now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, but you I, met met, I met him in Syria. Oh, in Syria. He came from Israel to Syria. That's how we met. And then afterwards, when I came, we sponsored his colleague because he wanted to come. And he came, then we got married. Ah, Yeah. How, how do you feel about the fact that the genocide has not been recognized by Turkey and by the country you're living in? now how do you what do you think mm -hmm. how does it affect you emotionally and intellectually that the turks have not acknowledged the crime of genocide and also that the americans until just recently when trying to stick it to the turks sorry wow. they haven't done it either what do you feel about that well I'll tell you, the Armenians are trying very hard to make them feel that they owe to us. Yeah, we know the Armenians are trying. How do you personally feel? Well, I feel that uh, they should accept what they did, but they don't want to accept it because they don't want to pay the damages that they did to the Armenian nation. They took a lot of things from the Armenians. They owe it all to the Armenians. But if they accept it, then they are going, the Armenians are going to say, oh, so you did it, now you pay the debts. But they won't accept it. Mm -hmm. I personally think that they should accept it because they did it. There is so much proof that they did this. It isn't hidden. It's well out in the open. There is so much proof that they did this genocide to the Armenians. Well, the Armenians had not done anything to them. Why, why do you think- They a very peaceful life in uh, uh, Turkey. Um, why do you think it, it hurts so much that they don't acknowledge it? Because they have to pay the price for it. No, she's asking from, your perspective, why does it hurt so much well, that they don't acknowledge it? Emotionally, why does it hurt? It hurts if, they, if anybody comes and kills your family members, how would you feel? You feel, you feel very upset. Is it justice? Is it no, sadness? It's combined. Yeah. Okay, it's that's a combined what thing. It's, it's not just right. They should have never done that. 
The army didn't do anything to them. In fact, the Turkey, they really worked hard to improve Turkey in every way. Did your parents ever talk about how they felt that Turkey didn't acknowledge it? Well, of course, we all feel very bad about that. They should really acknowledge it, accept it, and pay the price. What did your parents feel about it? Did your parents say, we're very upset? We, or, upset. or did they want to forget it? They did, of course. So did they, did they say, let's forget it, put it behind us, or let's make it no, no, known? No, go ahead and try to prove that they did it. That's yeah. the only thing. But Do you they're so sure in their politics. They find a way to cover it up. <laughs> do you think it's um? Do you think as the Armenian generations go on, people are going to start forgetting about it? I don't know about the young generation because once the all this old generation that went through it is gone and why you know they're all dead. I don't know. There might be some young generation yet they still have heard so much from, from their parents, they, they will carry it on. But eventually, what it will be, I don't know. And, go ahead, Ani. Oh, no, maybe the same point. I was like, why do you think, um, like, is it important to tell the story about your father and your parents, what they went through? Why is it important to, to share their stories? Uh, is it important know. to tell the Armenian story in general about your family as well? Is that important to do? And if so, why? Well, because they have really done so much for the nation, for the Armenian. Uh, if you had seen all this young generation that used to come from Turkey, you feel so bad, you know, and they all came to the orphanage. They didn't have anything. Uh, all those people, what they went through, how can we forget? How can I forget? Is it now, so my, you're- My yeah. daughter, will, my daughter, my son, or my uh, nieces here, they wouldn't feel the same way, I think, because they didn't see it. They didn't live with them. So is it important for the memory of your family is it also important for to, the nation. to educate the world on genocide? Is there a bigger lesson that, that uh, this memory it will, should it be? Will, yes, it will teach them not to stop it if they, something like this goes on. Yeah. To stop, never to let it go ahead because it ruins a lot of families. And I have a question, since you also lived through the Holocaust, like, you know, you were alive when it was happening. Um, did you did you feel, did it remind you in any way of what happened to the Armenians? Like, what, what were you feeling when you learned about what was happening in the Holocaust? This, this, on the same idea. Mm -hmm. It was on the same idea. The Jews were thrown out from Germany. You know, uh, I mean, why? Why did they do? Why did they do that? It wasn't right for the Jews. I guess I never, I never asked an Armenian person who lived through the Holocaust if it brought back memories of what happened to their family. So I wonder, what, what was it like at that time? Did you talk about with your family um, about the similarities with the Armenians? Like, what, what were the conversations you were having and the feelings you were feeling at that time? Well, really, we talked more about our genocide than the Holocaust because that was for the Jews to talk about. But there was a big uh, society, uh, big number of Jews living in Syria too. Wait, but while it was happening, you were living in America, right? The Holocaust? No, yeah. no, no, they, she didn't come until 47. So they were in Syria, the whole uh -oh. of the Holocaust. And I will say her, her brother, my father said, uh, they thought Hitler was amazingly cool, right? Wow. Yeah. Because they didn't know until very late in the Holocaust what had happened. 
yeah, that was absolutely. right. They just thought that he was you bringing valor. You take it up in history to, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So he but, said it wasn't I mean, until... We felt bad because we had gone through it and I know what they went through. I feel bad for them too. I wish they would stop this Holocaust, period. That's no good for any country or any race. Do you have any friends, Bagdasarian? Yeah, any any other Bagdasarian friends? Yeah. A couple. There were some in Syria too, Bagdasarian. Yeah, I have, we've actually I met. they related to you or it's a common la last name? I don't know. Um, well, my my Bagdasarian side actually comes from Egypt. Oh, from but, Egypt. But my, um, my other side, my mom's side actually also was in Aleppo. Also, also what he's from Zaytun, was imprisoned in Zaytun for, you know, he was a, he was a leader in the community and they imprisoned him just like you, your story. And he also ran an AGB orphanage uh, in Aleppo. So maybe they were friends. My oh. great great grandfather and oh. yours. Well, I know Balbasarian is not. Uh, it's not. It's it's. There's quite a few families Balbasarian. Well, this actually Balbasarian comes from Izmir, so the other side of Turkey. So I don't know if people from Izmir end up in Aleppo. Izmir? Where where were your parents from? That that this Balbasarian comes from Izmir, so yeah, the other Izmir. side of Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. But the side that is Chuljan Aharonian was from Aintap and Zeytun and Erzurum. So they all ended up in Syria. Oh. But Izmir didn't really go to Syria. So I don't think I'm related to those, um, oh. those Bagasarians. <laughs> but I, I have another question for you. You've been good friends with each other. Yeah. yeah. What, what was your question? Annie, what? Yeah. Oh, are we good friends? Yeah, we're very good friends. Uh, now, my mother named me, they named my brother Ara. Their father was Ara. And they said if it can, Syrian can be Syranush, why not Ara? <laughs> Aranush. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I like it. They made my name. Yeah, I never heard that name before until... Yeah, very so special. How you hear that name? Aranush. I've heard a few others that named their children Aranush. There was Anush. Anush was quite common. Vart Anush. Vart. Now, Vart can be a boy's name, and Vart Anush, Siran, Siranush, Haig, Haig Anush. You know, it's all you can make the feminine of it. So uh, Anush, you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, what does it mean to be Armenian to you? Well, it's my race. I'm proud to be an Armenian. I'm proud with my uh, country. I'm proud with my religion. Everything that they have given me, my parents, I'm very proud of. I'm lucky because I hear so many orphanage, orphans who have lost their parents, who never have inherited anything from their parents. At least we have a language. We are proud to have Armenia as our country. Why not? I wish we could all live in Armenia, but I don't think there's any possibility that we can all live in Armenia. A lot of people are born in America. They are used to American ways. It's hard for them to go and live in Armenia. Um, it, it's nice to visit, to have an idea, but to live your life there, once you're used to American ways, it's not that easy. Do you wish that you ever went back to Marash or Kharpert? No, just to visit, yes, not to leave, no. Because the same things are not there anymore. Their houses, their properties, their schools, there's nothing. All those things are changed. All those years, 
things are changed. They don't stay the same. And that made me think, does anyone in your family know if the building that was the orphanage in Aleppo is still there? Or what happened to the building? I think so that it is there because it was an old building. It was a big building. Yeah. Here. In the old, in the old in town, the old all cobblestone. Yeah. yeah, I think that it's still there. And when they closed the orphanage, do you know what, did it stay an Armenian building or it just became a regular building? Oh, I don't know. It belonged to the Muslims. We, my father had to pay rent. So I don't know what they did, if they made changes or not, I don't know. But his church, the Bethel church, oh, is standing. Oh, it's still there. It's oh. still Oh, that was his. He that was the church he where he was a pastor. He founded that church. Oh he wow! Founded, yeah, and yes. right before the Syrian uprising, they named the street there after him. Yeah, oh, the uh, street is yeah. named oh, after him. Wow. We've, had, we've had a lot of people mention that church. Yeah, that was yeah. his. Amazing. And then when we went to his orphan at our funeral, we were in the. We didn't have cars. We had carriages. You know with the horse, the horse store. We oh, got amazing. there and I said, oh, there must be another big funeral. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we didn't know. Then they said, this is all for the minister. It's all the people who bought land from him. They had all heard about it. They had all walked all the way from their homes all the way to the cemetery and we were waiting for us to come out from the church because we went to two churches. The first church was uh, Emmanuel Church and then we went to Bethel Church. From there we went to the cemetery and all the people were there. They had come for his funeral. Wow, he's a very amazing man. So, yeah. They used to call him, some of them called him Heirik. He was known as Heirik. <laughs> to some it was Bugville. Everybody called him something. <laughs> That's so, I, I've never, sorry, not to, not to um, make this about me, but that's so strange. I, I have the same exact story about my great great grandfather. That his funeral was huge, and that people, all his orphans, he ended up creating or helping to create the Armenian community in, in Uruguay, in South America. And all the orphans uh, who could went there, and they'd all be, or, or if they couldn't, they'd be writing letters to Heidi, calling him cool. father about about uh, about how much they loved him. And his funeral was enormous. They said and. That's amazing. These people who changed who changed lives, and then, wow! I didn't. I hadn't ever heard anybody else with a story like that. And it's it's interesting how similar they are. Um, um, I think I was just going to ask you about the names Bethel and Emmanuel. Those to me are both um, like Hebrew or or Old Testament names. Is yeah, that the they're, they're that? from the Bible. They're from the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, Emmanuel means, uh, what is the uh, meaning of uh, grace, Emmanuel? Hold on, let me Google it. But like, uh, aren't those traditionally used by, by Jewish people? Because I have here in my town, Temple Bethel, Temple Emmanuel. I'm well, curious, interesting they name. They the Bible too. I know, but I just haven't heard Armenian but churches. they read in the Bible. Yeah, their names, you can see it in the New Old Testament. Yeah, you're right. But Armenian churches are usually like Surp, Asiga, Surp, whatever. So oh, why, why didn't he do that? Yeah, we have some. Some, uh, but he, it happens he, that... Why didn't he pick that name for the church? Huh? Not, why didn't he pick those names for the church and not a more traditional Armenian name? I didn't father, get you. Why is father with us? I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Why did your father but it just, are a name that was more traditionally Armenian? Well, those names were used for the Protestant churches. Oh. Yeah. Emmanuel, Bethel, mm -hmm. Nahadagats. Now we had another church. The third one is Martyrs. 
You mm -hmm. have martyrs to treat too, I think in uh, Philadelphia, yeah. In Philadelphia. Not in New York also. In New York, there is one. It yeah, I go to that church. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, those were common names among the Armenians when they built churches to put those names. And I, sorry, I have one more question. Do you think that Syria did a better job of preserving what it means to be Armenian than America did? Do, do you think Syria, the Syrian yes. Armenians, preserved Armenian identity better than American Armenians? Well, you can preserve more because all your neighbors are Armenians. They all go to Armenian church. Uh, it's a little hard to keep your Armenian identity here because you are so mixed with the Americans in every way. You know, you're not in a neighborhood that's all Armenian or your organizations. I don't know how active they are here. Are they very active? Um, of the organizations? Not, not as active as we've heard in Syria. Yeah. And do you, I guess when you said all the Armenians were living together and when your father was selling land to Armenians, um, what do you think? Like, why did you think Armenians all wanted to stay together in one area of the city? Well, somehow, I don't know, you feel so much at ease when we were with Armenians. You speak the same language, you have the same background. So all these things tie you together. We can't do that with the Americans. <laughs> we don't have the same background. And I think that's why. When, when you came to America, how did you describe yourself to your peers and your friends? Did you say, I'm Armenian? Did you say, I'm Syrian? How did you describe no, yourself? We always said, I'm Armenian. We never said, we're a Syrian citizen, but not, we are Syrians. Right? Even if I'm with Armenian Syria, I would say, I'm, um, uh, I'm American citizen, but uh, I'm of Armenian descent. Because my parents are army. <laughs> um, and do you feel Syrian in any way or just the citizenship? Well, I, I gave up my Syrian. In Syria, in some countries you come from, you can keep your citizenship. Like I have a cousin, she's from France, but she can be both French uh, citizen and American. We can't do that. If you leave Syria, you give up your citizenship. So I have left my Syria. Uh, I say it was my con country for a while. I was brought up there. I went to school there and I had a pretty good life. I can't deny that. But now I'm in America, America is my country. <laughs> what, um, what do you think of what's happening in Syria and what do you hope for Syria? Like, and, and particularly, what do you hope for the Armenian people in Syria? Well, I, I hope that they, have, they don't go to any problems like the, uh, our older generation they went to. I hope they stay. Uh, if they can improve themselves by living and going to Armenia, let them, you know, it's their, our own country. If they can do it, fine. But if they are comfortable in every way, I don't think there is any danger. And I but guess, I, oh, you never know what could happen. This politics is very funny in this world. Today, you, you're friends with so, so many countries, you never know what will happen someday. And yeah. it can turn out to be enemies. And then it's entirely a different question. Would it be safe to live here or go to another country? And the, uh, some countries don't accept you anyway. 
there are certain countries they don't want any strangers to come to their country. They want to keep it just for themselves. Like Switzerland, it's very hard. Even I have cousins that used to work in Switzerland. They go during the day, they work during the day, at night they come back to France. Mm -hmm. They can't live in Switzerland. Very few people are accepted. Wow. And after all that work your father did in Syria to build the Armenian community there, yeah. if, if there were no more Armenians left in Syria, would, would that make you feel sad or it, it wouldn't matter? Well, it would make, make me sad, of course. Well, now there are people that have uh, running those things, the church, uh, uh, all people's home or any other building that he did. You know, well, he did his part. Now it's their turn to take it over and run it until something happens that they have to leave it to. I don't know what will happen then. That's why if you are in, in Armenia, I think you have more security for the future. But even then, you never know what can happen. We take chances. Thank you. Um, I, I guess the last question is, what you hope for just Armenians in the di in the diaspora, like for for um, what? Because you are so close to the generation of Armenians that were forced from their homes. So you you are you have their wisdom as close uh, as possible that any of us can get. So what do you think they would have wanted to see in the Armenians living in the diaspora and the generations to come? Or what, what would you wish to see in, those gener in the Armenians to come? What do you hope we keep alive? Well, I hope that they will be proud of the Armenian race and they will keep up our country uh, our culture. We have a lot of culture. We're an old nation. There is so much history. I hope they study that and they still be proud of Armenia. And uh, But in Armenia too, when I read some of their papers, I get so, there's a friend of ours, he gets hydranic. I don't know if you have heard that. It's an Armenian paper. And yet they have problems too. You know, even in Armenia they have problems. And how do you expect when they live in different countries not to have any problems? But they shouldn't forget their nation, their language, their race. They should be proud of it. And as much as they can, keep uh, telling about to your children so they can carry that feeling that they come from a very good intellectual nation. You know, uh, we have a lot of nice people, intellectual people who are very, if we had all the chances uh, that the young generation will have, they should really go ahead in life, invent new things. There is so much invention going on be interested in that and keep Armenia top. You know, I, I feel so glad when I read the things about Armenia that they have done this, they have done that. I was so proud. Why not? And uh, this little politics, sometimes they make a big issue about it. Forget that. Forget it. As a nation, we should get along well and go ahead with everything, with our culture. We have nice uh, poets who have written nice poems. Our language is so rich. Think about those good things in life and be proud of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This was really amazing to hear. Hear your story, hear your parents' story. It's great. Yeah. Grace and Joy, is there anything that you wanted to add that, or any other stories you wanted to include? Your pardon, I didn't get you. 
Oh, it was, a, it was a question to Grace. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been thinking if there's anything. Grace is going to ask a question. No, no, no. Um, I'm sure there is, there are, but I just can't think of anything off offhand. That's okay. And is Joyce still there? I think that they're both very proud of being Armenian. It's so amazing that, the work. Yeah, the work you've done to compile everything about about your grandma. I would say, uh, uh, Joy went to Armenia, but Grace hasn't gone. I wish someday Grace would go. <laughs> Have you gone? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I went to Armenia. Oh, yeah, you said you couldn't get into the museum. When did you go? What year? I wish I could go again, but I'm too old now. Around 28, 2010. Okay. okay. Wow. So yeah. About all the information. Well, it was nice meeting you too. <laughs> yes. I'm glad I could answer some questions. Yes. Maybe. Oh, thank you. Uh, but Hopefully one day we'll see you in Rhode Island. <laughs> well, well, Great. What were you saying? I hope that uh, you too can go if they have that conference in Armenia. That would be something else. You know. I was we will meet all kinds of Armenians from every country they're going to go. Wow. And there is so much to see, you know? And just the idea of hearing Armenian, the minute you get out, it's enough pleasure for me, you know? Yeah, we never hear that here. Uh, the minute we, get, we came out, ooh, <laughs> it's Armenian. They're talking Armenian. So nice. All the young people are talking Armenian. <laughs> uh, Anush, when you went to Armenia, did you feel like it was really your homeland, even though your yeah. Armenia is in Turkey? Uh, well, uh, yeah, somewhat you feel that, oh, it's so nice, you know, to feel that everywhere everybody's speaking Armenian, especially the language, when you hear, hear them, instead of hearing English, <laughs> you hear Armenian, it's so sweet. It, really, it was sweet. When you get on the uh, bus, it's Armenian. You go in the hotel, they all talk Armenian. And that, that was the most beautiful part, really. And I felt very, very good about Armenia. Uh, I don't know about living there. I don't know how I would feel. But just visiting and hearing all that and talking to everybody, and I felt very, very pleased. And it didn't, it didn't feel like a different Armenian to you? Yeah, they, some of them speak their... Uh, other Armenian, which we don't speak that, yeah. But uh, uh, what can, that, that's the way they brought up. How can you change it? That you yeah. understood each other? Yeah, they taught that way, so they speak they, that way. To us, it doesn't sound very nice. We are used to our, our Armenian here, you know. Uh, they call it, uh, there are two names they have. One is Arabian Hayeren, Arabian Hayeren, I don't know. But uh, well, we were brought up on this Armenian. So to us, this is what we like. But you understood but, each other well? Huh? You understood each other fine? Oh, yeah, yeah, we had no problem, but I'd rather hear the ones that speak my army. <laughs> it was, I felt more closer to them than I did to the other ones. Oh, actually, Ani and I wanted to ask you if you could speak some Armenian for us, because we wanted to see what it was like from Syria, the okay. dialect. Oh, okay. Halebin <laughs> Masin, well, yeah. how about Chef Sirovin? Kedisim. Him, yes, and get we never knew what the several chagani. Yes, Pokam Mitsaze. Pet Shat Sirovain. Etch that person children. Shat Zer Sirag Sirain. 
עם כאב לב שלנו, סירוב מנצים, בית מתייבס, יש בדיקה עם פשן וצנק. אם העיר אין קלן שדון דר ירן, עמוס נצן, זבק נרוני, נמם נגד, שם תל ווכצ'ן, ווכצ'ן, ענת שם כדי. בית, הגגן ששנה גרשת צורה בורי הלבי מיץ'. מגיש תדאקוניס? מנגו צ'אנן, מנגו צ'אנן, מנגו צ'אנן, מנגו צ'אנן, מנגו צ'אנן, מנגו צ'אנן, ‫אל תשכת אגנר אשד אנושה. ‫אין פרץ, אל לא מצב. ‫ידע שאתה תוניס קנץ. ‫פרץ שד עבור גרנס פרי גם נר שנר, ‫היה סטני מלך, ‫אמן, היה הלבי מלך. ‫היה סטנה צ'פצ'י גצן כאל גיא, ‫הנה, הייתי אותי אנקת על זה. ‫פרץ, הלבי שושנה גשת דר פרי. ‫-יא, נכון. ‫תהיה גרץ לבושנה גמת ‫שכשנס פרי גם נר. ‫תתוסי אשחר עם מת ש... ‫תוס גרץ אז חנות נר ההיין, ‫עבור ההיין גחוסין אמנה. ‫אמן פן ההיין גם גלה. ‫-יא, או שדלה. ‫אנו ששדק נר שתקה. ‫או שדלה. ‫גוזן כל בהנק ערב מדיין ההיינה, ‫סולאבה וורקיץ' מההיין גחוסין. היו, היו אנשים שעד לאו גלולה יתי אבי ניגר הנה הייתה סמי לי אבל אבי ניחוסי. יאה. כמו סוף תשגע. איש כנראה כנראה. אמן פעם ברוזרצים בית שלו. יאה. בית השיגה לאו הסכנה כבר, גיאנקים מייג. אמן פעם ברוזרצים בית שגנר עליו, וכי מייג הוזרים כתשמע. מאיר ביימן נרון, הדה, לאו אביב. ביימן נרגן. סו אינשקרנן כנל, צ'סקרנן פוחל, פאנר גבול צ'סקרנן פוחל. אנטומנו יש, יבדור הממד שרשרו יש, גיאנקית מצ'. וואו. 